opportunity gaps between low-income students and wealthier students. All of that existed before the pandemic. What we're going to see now, though, is that those gaps are widening, exacerbating, becoming bigger and bigger. Something needs to be done that the system we have is inadequate to meeting the needs of our people. It sounds like we are passively or not so passively leaving behind an entire generation of kids. So then when this happened and all of that was already happening, I was just like, oh, we're doomed at this point. My name is Ashu. I am a math teacher in DC and I'm going into my sixth year teaching. What was your experience like ending last year's school year and what are you most concerned with preparing for fall right now? As far as ending last year, it was very interesting just because as opposed to telling us schools weren't going to reopen, they just kept like pushing back the date. It has to be safe for the children and to be safe for the children, we must attack this coronavirus. We must kill it off. Cases were getting worse, but they were still like, oh, it went from two weeks to like, no, we're just going to be out for a month. Like, oh, no, like we're trying to get back to like normal. So like school's going to open eventually. Right. Till finally they were like, OK, we're not coming back. Do you think kids are being left behind amid these changes? 100 percent. A big thing for us was, of course, as soon as we moved to online teaching, you just assume kids had access to Wi-Fi or kids had access to technology at home. A lot of us were relying on our kids like having smartphones and that's not a thing always and also parents are like some of our parents are firm believers in that kids at a certain age shouldn't have a phone. I don't disagree with you. Hey, my name is Paul Rebel. I'm a faculty member at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and I served uh, Governor Deval Patrick as his Secretary of Education in Massachusetts for uh, five years and as Chairman of his Board of Education for a year. Given the moment that we're in, can you tell me a little bit about that? some of the things you're most concerned with when thinking about education moving forward in, in the age of COVID-19? If we had and we did have massive um, gaps in terms of access to opportunity and ultimately then student achievement in our education system. They just got a whole lot worse under the conditions of COVID-19. We have 13,500 school districts making their own policies under umbrellas created by the state. We went into this ed technology virtually overnight as schools closed and suddenly teachers and students found themselves online. You know, we have out in the suburbs, they're, they're doing this sort of corona pods now where they're getting you know, they're hiring individual teachers for groups of kids who aren't getting what they need in school and they're taking care of themselves. You know, if you're living in a much more disadvantaged circumstance, you simply don't have the resources to do that. That's what I'm worried is the gaps get larger and we, we have a one size fits all system and we've got to shift to a system that's gonna meet kids where they are, give them what they need. My name is Mara Teigen and I'm an associate professor of education at Bates College. Um, and I study rural education. But talk to me a little bit about the things that we weren't considering when we think about the urban-rural divide in this age of, of hybrid learning. At the beginning, it was really about internet access. One of the biggest challenges facing rural schools and communities is the lack of digital access or internet access. So then they're trying to figure out, well, how do we how do we remote teach when many of our students just don't have access? So that was kind of like the first round of challenges I really heard about. And then now those are kind of changing a bit as school, as we went into summer, and then now schools are thinking about reopening. It looks like reopening is going to be sort of punctuated at best with a variety of different models from hybrid learning, maybe a couple days a week to closed all together for periods of time if there's a resurgence. So how do we at least keep the gaps from getting any bigger than they already were. We know that students don't learn as well when they're under stress. And this is a stressful time. There's all kinds of economic stressors and then, you know, worrying about health. And then you think about who the pandemic has disproportionately hit. It's disproportionately hit black and brown communities and low-income communities. And so then we think about, okay, which children are facing the most stress and what is that going to mean for their learning. In America, we have held up education as being the great equalizer. Do you find that to be the case? No, not at all. It all always goes back to like lack of resources. So I think somebody in a school with the resources and with the funding they need, you're not going to burn out as quickly as a lot of us in these like Title I schools. And I know like 
a lot of the things that I ended up needing from my classroom just had to come out of my own pocket. My name is Lucero. I teach middle school. Um, it's called SEI in Arizona. It's in kids that are learning English as a second language. So my students are refugees, immigrants, the children of, of immigrants. And the fact that we live in a society and an economy that systematically excludes people of color, my students, my children, me, from opportunities for health, safety, and security. And I'm a teacher because I believe that we have a right to those things. I realized very quickly that the lives on the line were my children and my students. We had projections way back in March that, you know, like a modest estimate was we would start, we, we would have 1.4% of a student population infected. Mm -hmm. So in a school of a thousand kids, that's 14 students. That's half of one of my classes. Like not having Wi-Fi or, you know, relying on school meals. Those are, those are real things to worry about, but they're also issues that are like have a, a broader reason, right? We were used to schools being like this band-aid for social injustice mm -hmm. and used to 30 million kids coming into schools and eating. And we have to ask ourselves like 30 million families don't have enough food. Like that is a separate, very important issue that we need to deal with. And right now we're in the middle of this global tragedy that is literally killing people. Uh, we need to stop relying on stop gap measures. And the whole pandemic re response is around that. And all the logic is around like stop. What is the minimum we can do to just get people quiet and move on? And you know, it's not, it's not a valid response. My kids are just stuck at home in these like small apartments for a lot of them. And some of them with several younger siblings that they're taking care of. Some of them are like, if their parents have gotten sick, they were then looking out for their parents too. Like it was just a lot happening. But the cons are, of course, that all of my kids could come to school and get sick. And so then that's a whole new stress to deal with if you don't, if you can't afford like those medical bills and you do end up in the hospital. Um, if you end up sick and then they're still counting for attendance, and with DC, the way it works, if you miss so many days, then you have to um, be held back automatically. And so if the kids get sick though, it's like, so are we waiving it after so many days with this? If they don't go to the doctor, but just stay home, but we know for a fact like they did have COVID, are you still gonna count it? Because normally what it is, is like, you need a doctor's note for up to so many days. And so if they never go to the doctor, they just stay home, recover, and then come back does it not count and so it just it's like little things that just add up to the bigger picture of like we're no longer being helpful making these kids come back to school we actually have a plan it's a two-phase plan it needs to be funded right for how we could actually get support families and get through the pandemic in a way that continues to educate kids deals with the health issues and then you know creates a sustainable path forward we're not talking, you know, leadership isn't talking about comprehensive solutions. They want to look at these little things like that, like a tech, like technology, meals, all these little things. But a piecemeal solution isn't going to work here. What's the stake in the long term and how pivotal of a moment is this in sort of closing that gap or widening it potentially? I hope that in this, um, what I hope will be an interlude, we can at least develop a vision of where we want to go for a more just society for a society that really is committed to a lot of the rhetoric that we have about no child left behind, every student succeeds, every child a winner, all means all. But we haven't really built a system to achieve that.